Hello friends, a warm welcome to Indian Association for Bronchology's online certification course on thoracoscopy. We are so grateful to each of you all for the overwhelming support for the first three modules. And today is the first module and I'm sure that we'll have a record breaking support this time also. Uh, just a small introduction about this course. As you all know, this is an initiative taken by Indian Association for Bronchology. We, the governing council of IIB, are very, very keen that we help to make sure that there is IP training maximally available to everybody in our country because we feel that IP is something that will actually differentiate us pulmonologists from the physicians. And therefore, we want to put in our best to make sure IP comes to your home on a platter by a star faculty who have been doing fantastic work in the field of thoracoscopy. So we have 10 modules of this online certification course. To get the certificate, you need to attend at least eight out of 10 modules. And after the 10 modules are over, we have four workshops in four different parts of the country, north, south, east, west, on four different weekends. And therefore, you can attend any of one physical workshop that is close to you and suits your timetable. And the online certification thoracoscopy course will be given handed over in person at the physical workshop that you attend. So with this brief introduction, I would like to immediately start our uh, fourth module. Uh, this thoracoscopy module is on empyema and uh, it's on use of intrapleural agents. And we have a faculty which is absolutely a star faculty. We have a galaxy of stars over here who are doing fantastic work. I would like to introduce uh, first our moderator, who will be the captain of the ship today. We have none other than very popular, very respected, very esteemed Dr. DJ Christopher, who happens to be my very close friend also, and he needs absolutely no introduction. He is the past HOD and professor at the CMC Vellore uh, College. Uh, he has just so many achievements. He is the chair, Sandvik Advisory Committee, Indian Council of Medical Research, NIRT. He is the lead of research, pulmonary medicine at CMC and ICMR Collaborating Center of Excellence. He is a course director, ATS MECOR India. I think this is a huge distinguished uh, achievement, which we are so very proud about. He's, of course, the chair of research committee of our very own ICS. He's a past president, ICS and Indian Association of Respiratory Care, former chair, Indo-US Report TB Research Consortium. He's Stanford University has rated him as top two scientists in the world, which is unbelievable. Grand Challenge Awardee 2012. 240 publications, 15 chapters in books, and over 300 guest lectures. And most importantly, he has always been there for each of us every time we needed him. So with this brief introduction, Dr. Christopher, over to you. Let's please start the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Amita. Thank you for those very generous words of introduction. And good evening to so many of you who might have logged in from across the country. We welcome you on behalf of IAB. Uh, this series has made waves and uh, literally thousands have already watched these sessions. And we hope this will educate a lot of people uh, and uh, ensure that medical thoracoscopy, which is an important tool available to pulmonologists, uh, finds, it, finds its place in the armamentarium of the diagnostic capabilities that we require to investigate our patients. Now, today we are looking at uh, the role of uh, thoracoscopy in plural infections. Uh, so we are looking at complicated paranumonic effusions and we are looking at empyema. And uh, so this is a niche area where uh, people who have gone beyond biopsy and pleural disease have tried to use thoracoscopy to expedite uh, response and healing of patients. And so to, and we are also going to look at uh, another mode of conventional treatment, which is intrapleural fibrinolytics. So that also will be covered. So you have thoracoscopy in the concept or in the in the context of what we already have available and what is probably closest to being the best treatment 
uh, if you take thoracoscopy out of the picture. So to okay. give us the perspective on medical thoracoscopy and its role, we have none other than Dharmesh Patel. So Dharmesh Patel is a, a good friend of mine for a few decades now. And I watched him grow in stature as a pulmonologist. And I know of no one who is more passionate about thoracoscopy than him. Uh, we bought the flex rigid thoracoscopy maybe about uh, 18 years ago. I think we were the first to get it. But there were other people who were using doing rigid thoracoscopy before that. And I am sure Dharmesh was one of them. So he has done great work and with a lot of personal achievements and experience, he is probably the best person who can take us through this. Dharmesh, welcome, and we look forward to hearing you speak on this important topic. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Dharmesh, you are audible. Uh, thank you, Professor Christopher. Thank you, Dr. Nene and the IAB. Uh, great initiative, and uh, thank you for the invite. I think in the interest of time, uh, I'll cut down my customary uh, you know, usually usual introductions and straight away go to the point and which is thoracoscopy and empyemas. This is the brief today. And uh, we start off by this uh, very simple uh, uh, identification of what we mean by empyema. It's from the uh, later Greek word empyme or empyein, which means uh, to separate or bag of pus. And we all know that uh, when we draw fluid from the pleural cavity and we get what we see on your left side of the screen, that's frank pus, which is an empyema. But however, uh, all these other sort of fluids can all be uh, empyema as well. It could be serosanguinous fluid. It could be a turbid fluid, even hemorrhagic fluid, or the very transudative looking fluid can also be empyema. So we should not be really lulled by the impression that when we talk of empyemas, we only talk about frank pus. Uh, it's much before that. And any of these colors can represent empyema. And clearly the uh, characteristic features of a pleural fluid which suggest frank empyema would be a high protein in the exudative range, a very low glucose because the bacteria uh, consumes a lot of glucose and therefore the pleural fluid glucose reduces a very high LDH, as you can see here, high white cell count and polymorphic predominant. One must remember that ADA is very high in empyema and therefore that should not be a differentiating factor of anybody concluding that this is a tuberculous empyema because we know that in bacterial empyemas, just as in malignancies as well, ADA can be high and this is the ADA2. And in tuberculous effusions, we see ADA1, but because we do not have the abilities to differentiate between ADA1 and ADA2, it is a composite ADA features and a high ADA uh, does not necessarily mean tuberculosis, but it also could be empyema in the given clinical and biochemical features. How do you really manage? And that is some principles which have been given 2,500 years ago from the Romans, when they say that where there is pus, evacuate it. Ubi pus, ibi evacua. And the ways to do that has been a chest drainage or a surgical procedure, which uh, my dear colleague, Dr. Bhanushali has very kindly offered me this video. And these are the two sort of, you know, sacrosanct ways of managing uh, empyema for many years. That is a drainage through a chest drain or a surgical procedure. However, we have the chemical fibrinolysis story, which will be well expounded by the next speaker. And both the Hippocrates, Shauliak and Burhave in Germany all have shown that infusing various sorts of stuff into the pleura helps in relieving symptoms whether it be warm wine or warm wine with honey and river water, or even injecting anticoagulation into the plural space does help in reduction of the uh, uh, empyema. And this really was the predecessor of what then became a fairly routine type of uh, investigations, culminating into the MIST 2 trial uh, conducted by Najib Rahman and his colleagues from all over published in 2011 at the New England Journal of Medicine. This was a double blind, double uh, randomized, uh, double blind study of, of uh, about 178 or more patients 
into four different arms, TPA DNAs, TPA DNAs and placebo. And it's clearly seen that the TP DNAs uh, arm, there was a reduction in the uh, radiological, there was an improvement in the radiological uh, features. There was the 77% reduction in surgical referrals, which is a, a fairly uh, impressive figure. And the number of days in hospital also reduced when you gave patients TPA DNAs compared to all the other three arms. And this therefore uh, laid the foundation of uh, recommending uh, TPA DNAs uh, as a treatment of plural infections when initial chest drainage has stopped and leaves a residual plural collection, a conditional recommendation by the BTS guidelines of 2023. This other option was VATS access should be considered over thoracotomy for adults in the surgical management of plural infection. Let me emphasize over here that the guidelines of 2023 do not mention the brief which we have, which is medical thoracoscopy as a treatment in plural effusions or infections because of lack of evidence yet. However, what do we do in India? And I was quite keen when these guidelines came up of TP and DNA's recommendation. And though this is no rocket science research, all I did was I sent a WhatsApp invitation to 60 pulmonary physicians from the various tire cities of one, two, and three. There were 54 responses. Both private and government practitioners were uh, accessed through the WhatsApp. And I asked them two questions. Do you use TP and DNAs for plural infections? Yes or no? If no, there were six reasons why they did not use it. And then the second question was, do you do medical thoracoscopy? Yes or no? And if do you do it for plural infections, namely for additional lysis? And if you don't, would you refer them to an intervention pulmonologist for thoracoscopic additional lysis or refer them to a surgical colleague? And this was the spread. And you can see that it has been about 44.4% were from Tire 2, 46 from Tire 1, which would be in all the more important four important cities of the regions of the country, and Hyderabad and Bengaluru. And there were Tire 3, 9.2. Almost all the states represented except the Northeast. And the spread was 72% were private and 27.7% were government. And almost all, almost all, no, all 54 who responded says they do not use TP and DNAs. And the reasons given predominantly were the prohibitive cost and more importantly, difficult in procurement, which we all know that DNAs is not available in this country. And the cost of fibrinolytics, if you use TP and DNAs, comes to about 1,65,713, equivalent to a uh, GB, that is uh, British pounds of 1,665, compared to the cost in England, which is about 738, and in America, it is about $7,000. So you can see this is a costly way of managing plural infections. But this is not only in India, along the course, across the world, when the Australians did a survey of the real world use of intraplural TP and DNAs, it wasn't surprising that only 44 of the 49%, 49 people responded, used it. And out of the remaining 35 used it only 50% of the times. And the problems were multifold. They used it when conventional treatment fails, but there was insufficient efficacy data, which they felt. Safety data they felt was insufficient. Prohibitive cost was also in the sort of first world countries. And there were other sort of uh, minor uh, causes which were given. And therefore, the conclusion was that this survey observed a large variation in the current treatment protocol of using TPA DNA therapy worldwide and was needed more data. This was 2022. So how do we manage empyemas in our country? And the same questionnaire which I had put forward through WhatsApp said 66% uh, of people responded said they would do medical thoracoscopy and use additional lysis. 12.2% uh, sorry, 22.2% said they would refer to surgeons. However, there was 31.4% of the patients who said, of, sorry, of the respondents who said they would use fibrinolysis, which is in the form of streptokinase, urokinase, and a couple of them using TPA. And these were some of the responses of those you do thoracoscopy. Oh, uh, minor. Sorry? Uh, is there any disturbance or can you hear me and see my slide? Yeah, carry on, Dharmesh. There's no issue. So there was this things like, you know, I don't use either plural in, I don't use either that is TPA DNAs in plural infections. And I always cut the additions. Others said, of course I use thoracoscopy and hell yes. And somebody says, that's crazy to use 
uh, TPA DNAs or fibrinolytics because significantly thoracoscopy shortens the course of illness. It saves lives, pe saves people slipping into septic shock, et cetera, et cetera. So these were some of the uh, uh, remarks to the questions which were put forward. Why really should thoracoscopy, especially medical thoracoscopy, be used for additional lysis? Namely, unavailability of intrapleural enzymatic therapy. And since we have a large number of people attending this, including postgraduates, let's get the semantics right. Intrapleural fibrinolytic therapy, IPFT, is the use of streptokinase, urokinase, or TPA. But when we talk about intrapleural enzymatic therapy, we talk about these fibrinolytics combined with DNAs. So the real terminology to use is IPET, when you use streptokinase, urokinase, TPA, along with DNAs. The non-availability of thoracic surgeons and patient dynamics, which is so unique in our part of the country where there is late presentations, there are comorbidity and more importantly, the cost. And more importantly, the Indian intervention pulmonologist is the BN and all of everything. They wish to do everything and therefore they will push the boundaries. They will not stop at diagnosing plural malignancies or doing pleurodesis. They will go ahead and try and strip pleuras, removing slough, removing additions. And as a result of which it gives us this you know, both a very risque behavior as well as a very fulfilling behavior when you do these procedures purely pushed because of lack of, you know, infrastructures. So what does thoracoscopy do in empyma? It opens locules by removing additions. It aspirates pleural and viscous fluid. It accurately places the chest tube. It allows lung expansion. And again, in our part of the world, it's very important where TB is endemic, that TB versus bacterial empyma can be very well differentiated through microbiology and biopsy. I start off by giving you one example only, which I saw a few weeks back, of a 54-year-old male, sorry, that's not female male, an auto rickshaw man who was diabetic he had 12 days of fever, breathlessness, and left chest pain. You can see the X-ray, which shows a left sort of, you know, effusion. And aspiration was done in the neighboring state of Rajasthan, where a clear fluid was clear, but it did show a high total count and 80% volume offs. It showed a high LDH of 1056 and a high ADA of 125. His counts were 21,580. His ESR was high. The physician started him on intravenous antibiotics. So the next three weeks, we have the x-rays which showed hardly any improvement and ultrasound was done which showed 300 to 400 mils of fluid with multiple septations but all at a second place the physician managed was just about 15 20 ml of pus and no more he was then referred to me for a chest drain a CT thorax was also done and you can see the thorax just shows some form of lenticular effusion loculated and if you compare it with normal scans which you see of pleural fluid, you'll see the density a bit high, suggesting that this is a complex pleural effusion, i.e. an empyema. At this stage, you would have the possibilities of chest drain, of course, to be put in, but would you put in intrapleural enzymatic if it's available or intrapleural fibrinolytic therapy or you would refer it to the surgeons or you would embark on a medical thoracoscopy? The decisions here are based on available resources, on physicians' philosophy and economic consideration. Here is an auto rickshaw driver who would probably not at least afford, is a question is not affordability, availability of DNAs rules out IPET, fibrinolysis, streptokinase. If you believe the evidence, then you wouldn't use it. But we all know that we've used it with good results. Economic considerations were severe to send him to a surgeon. And therefore, I embarked upon a medical thoracoscopy. And on your right screen, you can see me pulling out all these slough and, uh, uh, and and trying to debride a bit of pus, which is that now when you see this picture, putting in just a chest drain wouldn't have really sorted the problem at all. You had to go beyond that. And then there are these various locules at other places, which also sort of needs to be broken. And again, in the interest of time, I'll straight away go to about half of it, where through the forceps, I try and break these locules, puncture them by the forceps, release the fluid, and suck the fluid. My aim being a multi-loculated pleural space to be collected, converted into a unilocular space and thereby improve drainage, possibly improve the penetration of antibiotics, help me to put a chest drain in. And when we get all this slough out and when we biopsy the pleura, we find the granulomas and AFB, and therefore it's an additional advantage of getting a diagnosis. And therefore this patient was put on anti-TB drugs and four weeks into that, the x-rays are available to you showing a fairly decent sort of improvement. And I'm pretty sure in two months time, this left lower zone shadows, which are also going to improve, not to speak of his toxemia and the counts which all reduced. So MT and empyma, is it effective? Is it safe? 
when do you do it and how do you do it are the predominant questions we are asking today. It is effective as was shown in 1996 by these two surgeons from Israel who looked at 380 patients with chest drainage and antibiotics. 107 failed and they went on to do a pleuroscopy via mediaskinoscopy with good results. And though this is a long paragraph, it sums up the role of thoracoscopy when they say that we found excellent aid in evacuation of the empyema. It helped in determining the stage of the empyema and why empyemas were not responding. Toilet pleuroscopy, in other words, giving them a good saline flush, also helped in empyemas, evacuating the pus help. It is also useful in fibrinopurulent stage when the organizing process has just about to begin and the pus is thick and mixed, but in still semi-organized. It, it is at also fragmented. You can fragment and remove this pus using suction device. And when the empyema is multiloculated, the septa composed of fibrin can be broken and removed in pieces. Tube drains can be inserted and left into space. And using this simple approach, thoracotomy can be avoided in the great majority of the patients. This summed out the role of thoracoscopy in plural infections. And they concluded that should be used liberally in the management of, management of empyemas. Followed, followed studies, further studies followed in Italy, where again they showed that using medical thoracoscopy was able to improve in about 91% of the patients with only few sent for surgery. And the Greek group also showed with their very catchy quote of, if an empyema does not rupture, death will occur. And they showed that no, it doesn't happen, which is that. And if you use medical thoracoscopy, you have a success rate ranging from 75 to 97% with very few complications. And this was the randomized trial which came from Harvard, uh, I think, uh, Florida and Mayo Clinic, where this group of patients was small. They were only 32 randomized into 16 each. And this also showed that the median length of stay using thoracoscopy reduced the thera therapeutic failure with IPFT was a bit less, though the p-value was not significant. And an estimated cost was about 12,032 for IPFT compared to thoracoscopy, which was about 9,682 for them to conclude that an effective treatment of early plural infection in selected population might shorten hospital stay as compared to fibrinolysis when performed, remember, in high volume plural centers by experienced intervention pulmonologists. Friends, I cannot emphasize the fact that if you look at some ads on your television, they clearly give an adage when they do heroic things like like people, you know, upside down on motorcycles or flying off in from the, you know, tarmac into it, where they say that please do not, you know, imitate these at your home because these are done by special per people who are well trained. And I cannot emphasize that same adage when you are dabbling with thoracoscopy for empyemas that this is not meant for the starters and only in very high volume centers with high skill should you venture for these things. The SPIRIT trial, which was studying proscopy and routine infection treatment, sadly did not take off because in Britain they could not sort of, you know, get their logistics right. And therefore, this trial, which would have looked into medical thoracoscopy as an early sort of treatment, would have given us good results. But then the MIS-2 trial, which is again a, just a trial which showed whether it's a possibility of doing further large trials by trying to figure out whether you can randomize patients effectively and follow them up or not, did show that a definite trial is feasible. It identified interesting signals of potential advantage of early treatment using each modality. For example, the length of stay for surgery. Remember, friends, this is VATS and not medical thoracoscopy. So get that clear. We are not talking about medical thoracoscopy. This is VATS versus IPET. And IPT had better euro quality of life. Further, they said valuable insights from this trial give them that the complexity of trial design in this area can be further designed for future studies. Is the procedure safe? Again, from the Greek group, shows that the additional lists which you carry out in empyema, the morbidity is less than almost 1%. And a series of further tests, which series of further authors, which they analyzed, showed that the complication rates for these patients is less than 1%. And there was just overall one mortality, which is there. When do you use it? Now, this is the important point. Imaging, such as ultrasound and CT health, 
pleural fluid, characteristic cells and clinical conditions. Here is an ultrasound where you see very thick septa and I would urge it is no point dabbling your hand in doing medical thoracoscopy because this needs the skilled hands of a surgeon to go in, whether he uses bats or three-port procedure or an open one, it's up to him. But these are certain things. Then you can see the significant pleural thickening where you're not very skilled at decortication. You would remain out and not do a medical thoracoscopy or a diaphragm, which has been fairly inverted with a lot of debris. This is uh, some of the factors where you probably think of not doing a thoracoscopy or CT scans like this, where again, the pleura is very thickened or here, there are several locules all around. This somehow will give you some idea of which really modality to choose. So timing is very important. Earlier, the better. Best results in exudative phase and fibrinoproliferative stage of empyemas, Lodim Kemper, saying that if the indication for placement of a chest tube is present and if facilities are available, thoracoscopy should be performed at the test of time of chest tube insertion. So the earlier, the better. It may not be effective in organization stage. And of course, we saw that we need to do it a randomized proper trial with IPETs. And therefore, two stalwarts of uh, plural effusions, namely Richard Light and uh, Stephen Sand, says that we think that the adage the sun should never set on a plural effusion should be modified to read the sun should never set on a paranemonic effusion because timing is most important, critical, inappropriate management. And this is what I call the arc of opportune, where as the fluid moves from a simple paranemonic effusion to a complex paranemonic effusion, the exudative phase to the fibrinoproliferative phase and to the organized phase picked up by pH, glucose, and LDH, here is the arc where by doing a medical thoracoscopy, you may be able to get good results. In the organized phase, the time's gone. You hand it to your colleagues, surgical colleagues. In the initial stages, you may not need to intervene and get away with either chest drainage or maybe intraproral fibrinolytic or enzymatic therapy. Now, techniques to learn. This is very important. Choose your ports well. This is a very poor port entry. If I go in, I cannot see the plural space at all, and I'm hit with a lot of slough and debris versus this one, which is an optimal entry point where, because of my pre-procedure selection, I've managed to dodge the various septa and slough and managed to enter into the plural space quite effectively. And this is the making the entry point from my friend, Dr. Arjun Srinivas, who I'm thanking him for this video, where he very meticulously first pinpoints where he will go using a combination of ultrasound and location. He's looking at the trapezius muscle and he's using a mid axillary line. And then he confirms where there is, it's away from all the septa and pleura and then marks the point to go in further, which is there. More importantly, it is this triangle. If you need to put two more pots, then they should be in a triangular fashion. Techniques to learn, ability to have an array of instruments. And I cannot emphasize, friends, that you need the backup of a large number of instruments if you want to dabble with empyemas in medical thoracoscopy. The Alice dissecting forceps, you need the suction, you need the 60 degree north hold sort of grasper, you need the ovum forceps, and of course, the thoracoscope and your sort of, you know, uh, biopsy forceps. Here is some, here I'm using just the forceps to remove thin septa. Here is a suction cannula, which is being used as a, for a single port thoracoscopy. This is a forceps and suction cannula combination, where I snip it all the locules and then use suction. Here is a dual port where I've put a second port in and I'm using a suction cannula to try and get all the slough out from there. Subsequently, a grasper is used, again, a two-port thoracoscopy where a grasper you use to peel out actually all this slough, which is uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, sticking on onto the parietal and visceral pleural surface. And the techniques to learn is there is a systematic way of doing it. You remove first the peripheral one, then one on the lungs, go for the diaphragm, and finally the ankle side, and remove as much as you can. In the interest of time, I'll try and sort of move this fast. But you know, you go in these ways clockwise from various positions to try and use different instruments to try and do a complete job, which is there. Uh, limitations, do not do my friends, if you do not have the time, this is a time consuming procedure, often taking two to two and a half hours to complete the procedure. If you do not have the patience, then do not dabble with it. If you do not have a surgeon's mind, my plea is don't bother. You need dexterous fingers, you need ample accessories, and you definitely need a surgical backup. The limitations are if you have decortication, 
if you see the pleura thickened, you may not be very good at decortication. I'm not good at peeling off pleuras from the visceral pleura from the lung surface because of the dangers involved in that. I am also not good at removing very thick sloughs such as these. And therefore, I would urge you to avoid going in for thoracoscopy in such situations or for that matter in where you can't see the lung very clearly as in these two places where it's fully layered with pus and you can see all the thick, you can't see the lung at all. You have in danger of causing problems. And these are the problems of creating air leaks. As you see in this uh, video where I have created an air leak where I cannot see the uh, uh, pleura and there you can see the air bubbling through that. Luckily, these are small leaks which settle down with a wide bore ICD after that and you don't need to do anything. Or for that matter, these are the intrapleural bleeding where I've tried to remove that not knowing that there is a fairly significant vascular septa below that. And when I pinch that, I find they're bleeding there continuously. So these are some of the things which you need to, in summary, techniques to learn, choose your ports wisely, have access to a gamut of accessories and know how to use it, do a systematic and complete job, limitations to know you are not a surgeon, avoid what is their domain, do not make it an ego issue, do not keep struggling for more than two, two and a half hours. If you can't do a great job, back up and say, there's no harm in saying, look, I have not been able to do a full job and it is possible that I might need a surgical colleague to come in and know how to handle complications and when to seek help. And as always, as an IP, I like putting this last slide that whenever you venture for a procedure, use prudence, use the appropriate equipment to get the good results and always have collaboration. Thank you, Professor Christopher and the IIB and all my colleagues who have been listening to this. Uh, thank you, Zarmesh, for that very outstanding and lively presentation, uh, very nicely illustrated. And you could do that since you are involved with this science and with your experience, you have made this, uh, this subject quite clear to the listeners. You have shown the merits of the procedure and you have also, uh, also sounded a, a, a note on the uh, on the risk of amateurs venturing into this if they do not have the skill, training, or the time. Thank you very much. Yeah. And we will continue to discuss this in our panel discussion. And I'm sure you'll be around to answer the questions that may come up. Uh, before we go on to the next lecture by Nitin Jain, I just want to very nicely illustrate that. Do that deviate from here and thank Academic partners, you have so met Mr. Sipla India have this subject outstanding here. academic partners and have helped us to bring this initiative to you. We thank them wholeheartedly. We want to especially mention three names of people who directly are involved in bringing this across to all of us, which is Mr. Harshal Gungurde, Mr. Ashi Shukla, Ms. Pranali Mehule. Uh, we thank them on behalf of IAB and also on all your behalf, since they are the ones that help us bring this across to you. Right. We will now move on to the next lecture. And to give that, we have Dr. Nathan Jain. He is going to bring to us the science of intrapleural uh, fibrinolytics and intrapleural enzyme uh, treatments. Uh, so, Dr. Nitin Jain is a MD in respiratory medicine. He holds a fellowship in medical pleuroscopy and he has had other trainings in interventional pulmonology. He is Joint Secretary of the Thoracic Endoscopy Society, member of the governing body of IAB and he holds other positions as well. So, we have... Uh, several questions that cover the spectrum of plural infections. You know, we had two speakers. The first one is already finished. The second one is going to speak. But they're going to talk on, uh, they, their talk was focused. So in the interest of many of you who have logged in, who may want an overview of the subject, uh, uh, I have the first question, question to Dr. Varun. Dr. Varun, uh, yeah, what do you think are the 
common causes of exudative pleural effusion? Sir, for India, we can consider the most common exudative cause for the exudation is uh, tuberculosis followed by a paranumeric effusion and uh, I can say the malignancy is come to the third part in a, in a exudative effusion in India. So we'll be talking on the intrapleural uh, fibrinolytics in the cases of empyema. Uh, these effusions and empyema, we all know that remains a common and a burdensome clinical entity with poor prognosis. The loculated pleural effusions or empyema is the compartmentalization of pleural fluid cavity into the smaller spaces by fibrous septas. And fibrinolysis is a medical intervention uh, which is introdu introduced intrapleurally and that degrades the fibrin and dissolves the fibrin membranes responsible for the formation of loculation. Uh, it is the Tillet and Sherry who first used the streptokinase to treat, uh, uh, for the treatment of empyema. And fibrinolytic therapy was reintroduced by Berg with more purified form in of the strep. Dr. Jain, will you make this slide presentation mode? Yes, thank you. So uh, the fibrinolytics uh, agents activate the system by the conversion of the pro-enzyme plasminogen into the active enzyme plasmin and that degrades the fibrin and dissolves the fibrin membranes responsible for the formation of loculation. So this is the picture which has been showing an uh, ultrasonogram with the loculations. So this is the most important slide which uh, classifies the paranemonic effusions. And where uh, we have to use the fibrinolytics is basically the class 5 and 7, that is the complex complicated paranemonic effusions and the complex empyema, uh, where there is, uh, in the complex complicated paranemonic effusions, the gram stains or cultures are positive and they are multiloculated. And in, in this case, uh, rarely the thoracoscopy or decortication is needed, while in the complex empyema, the frank persists present and there are multiple locules. Here also a tube thoracostomy with fibrinolytics, but often requires thoracoscopy and decortication. Uh, these are the fibrinolytic agents which are commonly being uh, used like streptokinase, urokinase, LTPlase, tenecteplase with uh, uh, DNAs. Methods of administration, as Sarah has already told that it is the tube thoracostomy or medical pleuroscopy or VATS. These are the agents uh, with their dosing schedules, though uh, we will talk about the dosing later in our slides. So this is a case uh, of a 40-year-old uh, smoker, non-alcoholic male presented with fever, cough, and SOB. Uh, the patient presented at the pleural fluid analysis is suggestive of the low pH with the low glucose and ADA high. And on culture, it is capsula positive. And on USG, uh, it has been shown that there are multiple locules. So we have gone through the treatment, we have given antibiotics, we have given uh, done the medical peroscopy with adhesiolysis and have used uh, IPFT in this case. And this is the post-procedure picture and this is the picture of after four weeks, which has shown the complete resolution. This is the second case of 49-year-old diabetic, non-smoker, non-alcoholic male presented with chest pain and cough. And here uh, again, it is the appearance is turbid fluid and pH is low with low glucose, ADA 93. Cultures are negative, but MTB cultures came out to be positive. And USG is again uh, showing a multiple locules. And here the we have given the anti-TB therapy with IV antibiotics and tube thoracostomy. Uh, but on the uh, in the follow-up uh, uh, X-rays, the fluid was still persistent, and we use IPFT and has uh, and the results were fantastic. This is again a 35 years female presented to complaints of fever and cough and pleural fluid analysis has shown the frank purse with low pH, low glucose and other a neutrophilic picture. Culture has shown pseudomonas and CBNAT and cultures were negative for mycobacterium tuberculosis. In this case also we have gone through the antibiotics, pleuroscopy with the digitalysis and IPFT and this is the follow-up x-ray four to six weeks later. So uh, this Earlier in 2019, a Cochrane database review was uh, done and it has shown that fibrinolytic agents via an intercostal chest drain cannot be recommended as standard treatment for paranemonic effusions and empyema. But later in 2019, they have shown that they were associated a reduction in requirement of surgical intervention 
and overall treatment failure and also showed the evidence related to adverse events were insignificant with the use of IPFT. This was the MIST-1 trial where intrapleural streptokinase for pleural infection was used and this is the only trial which is completely contraindicated to all the other trials and uh, there, there is no significant radiological resolution. The subgroup analysis with uh, loculated diffusion, frank purse, chest tube size, all failed to show any benefit. And streptokinase failed to show any benefit and on the contrary showed the adverse events. While it is the MIST-2 trial where the tissue plasminogen activate and DNAs was used and the trial outcome has shown that there was when uh, it has been divided into TPA alone, DNAs alone, TPA and DNAs and a placebo. And in the TPA and DNAs, the change from baseline in hemithorax areas by the effusion has been changed uh, uh, with a good percentage and surgical referrals and hospital stays were less. While they were slightly lesser for the TPA alone and DNAs, they were very bad when it was used alone. So MIS-2 trial, when compared to other trials, uh, it has been seen that uh, MIS-2, Piccolo, and Majid et al., they have used the doses in 10 milligram BD of TP and 5 milligram BD of DNAs in six doses. And the results and efficacy came to be around 90 to 96%. While the ADAPT 1 and 2 trials, where the dose of TP and DNAs were less, the results were nearly around 71 to 89%. These are again some other trials uh, with urokinase, LTPlase, and tenecteplase with placebos and have shown the reduced need for surgery and no significant increase in the bleeding. Uh, this is a MIS-3 trial, which has recently been published. And here also they have uh, divided it into a three arms, the conventional one, the IPFT one, and the VATS one. And it has shown that the early use of VATS has shortened the length of the hospital stay but it signals uh, towards earlier resolution of pain and return to usual functions with the use of intrapleural fibrinolytic therapy. This is a five-year study for uh, fibrinolytic therapy in loculated effusions, and which has shown that the VATS is more invasive, not easily available, and is more expensive, while IPFT is less invasive, cheaper, and easily accessible if used early in loculated pleural effusions. So it is a safe and cost-effective option in the management of selected patients. This is again uh, intrapleural fibrinolytic therapy in the, uh, in the treatment of adult paranemonic effusions and empyema. And it has shown, uh, this is a single study of streptokinase versus urokinase, where no clear difference between treatment requirement or surgery was seen. Uh, LTPlase versus urokinase are also shown no clear difference in requirement for surgery. And LTPlase and urokinase, the LTPlase has shown to have more side effects, primarily bleeding. Uh, this is a trial which has shown that streptokinase and urokinase has shown to have increased the drainage of after the fibrinolytic treatment to 73%. And in children with loculated empyemas can successfully be treated without invasive interventions with the use of IPFT. This is again a comparative study uh, using streptokinase and urokinase, which has shown that both, uh, the, both are safe and effective methods, while STK and uh, the uh, urokinase being used in both the arms, and the later may be preferred, the urokinase, because it, it has a better safety profile and ease of administration, like the one's daily dose, while the STK is being STK doses are like very different and like some people use once a day and some people use twice daily and, and, and also in different, different doses. This is again a article on the intrapleural fibrinolytic therapy in paranemonic effusions using tenecteplase and it has shown 84.5% effect in, in, in such cases and 92% in the complicated paranemonic effusions. This is again another study with tenecteplase alone, which has shown that whenever there is a complete and a near complete drainage of pleural fluid in all the cases, except the one who needed the additional thoracotomy with decortication, an efficacy rate was 92% uh, and adverse events in only 6% cases were seen. This is again a retrospective review of LT plays and surgical interventions. And it has been seen that the dosage of TPA were one to five doses of two to 50 milligram that is different in different uh, patients. 
and it has been seen that uh, the baseline chest radiograph in IPFT group was more worse. And at one week interval, the radiological success rate with IPFT was more than the surgical part. Though uh, in the later stages, the surgical arm has shown a better success rate of 80%. But uh, the IPFT is uh, with lesser complications and with lesser morbidity. So it is comparable to surgery in radiological outcome, inflammatory parameters, and length of stay. Uh, this is again a meta-analysis of a randomized controlled trial, 10 trials of uh, 977 patients where streptokinase, urokinase, and uh, lt plays were used in different doses, and it has shown that there are decreased chances of surgical intervention and the length of hospital stay. This is again a systematic review and meta-analysis which has shown that whenever there is the, the loculated pleural effusions, we can first use the fibrinolytic therapy to prevent the need for surgical intervention. Uh, this is again a review article from 2022 uh, that in the adult patients with stage 2 and 3 empyema, uh, the, the VATS has been used uh, prominently, but here in the combination recently reported that equal efficacy of VATS and IPFT, which opens a window of opportunity to expand the use of pharmacological treatment in advanced stage empyemas. And it has also been seen that the, in the pediatric empyemas with minimal mortality, IPFT is the effective and uh, the first line treatment for empyema in pediatric patients. And the recent approaches to treat empyema patients with surgical contraindications also, IPFT was considered to be the best treatment option. This is again uh, an original investigation by 2023. Uh, intrapleural fibrinolytic therapy versus surgery for complicated pleural effusions. The median duration of both are comparable in the IPFT and surgery groups. However, the hospital stay tends to be longer in the IPFT group, although the difference was not significantly more. Most important thing is the cost-effective analysis of fibrinolysis versus thoracoscopic decortication for early empyema. And it has been seen that uh, earlier use of the intrapleural fibrinolytic therapy, uh, the, it is definitely the fibrinolysis is more cost-effective option and surgeons should consider the patient's specific, specific factors as well as the cost and effectiveness of both the modalities deciding an initial treatment for early empyema. This is a survey for medical thoracoscopy practices in India, which was conducted in 2021 and nearly around seven years and it has shown that it is nearly seven years that the thoracoscopy has been widely used in India. And this is the thing which is uh, like these webinars and workshops we are doing just to train the people more and more about this process. This is an added advantage to uh, diagnose and to do the therapeutic procedures, specifically like adhesiolysis in cases of loculated effusions. And training, is, and training and expertise is must before performing these procedures. So in conclusion, the IPFT forms an integral part of therapeutic armamentarium for empyema and complicated pleural effusions. Various fibrinolytic agents with varied doses are available with variable efficacy safety profile. However, the overall efficacy ranges between 84 to 96%. IPFT offers added advantages that include reduced invasiveness, lower morbidity, cost effectiveness as compared to surgical intervention. IPFT is a relatively safe and effective procedure with non-serious side effects. Since varied dosing and schedule for IPFT are available, it is high time that we should have a single consensus to be made for the same, and we should make uh, guidelines for the Indian guidelines specifically, as uh, we are using more of the streptokinase because it is the economical one, and except the missed one, all other trials are in the favor of streptokinase. LT plays is also showing to have good results, but DNA is not available here. And LT plays use is costlier than the streptokinase. And they are in the certain studies, I have shown that both of the, them are more or less comparable. So uh, we should always choose uh, the modality, which is safer, which is cost effective, which is which in which you are expert. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jain. I think we have you have very lucidly uh, communicated to us the role of intrapleural treatments, and you have covered a lot of studies that have been done. Uh, I 
Yeah. Well, unfortunately, the last has not been said. We do not know which is the best, uh, which is the best combination. Now, what we know is alteplase plus uh, DNAs uh, is probably, probably the best the that has been studied. Unfortunately, DNAs is not available. So we are stuck with one leg. Uh, one leg. And so they are like, there are a lot many trials with the single arm and showing good efficacy. That's right. why we need more studies. With right. So the, we st all started with single agents. Yeah. And then the mist came and changed everything. Uh, then there is a slight resurgence of thinking. So let's discuss all this. But thank you very much for thank you, sir. the excellent presentation. And uh, we are going to come back to some of the aspects that you brought out in your, uh, in your lecture in our discussion. So before we proceed further, I want to introduce my panelists. So first, uh, Dr. Abhijit Ahuja. Uh, he, in addition to his qualification, has the European Diploma. He is an IAB Fellow. And also he has uh, overseas exposures and trainings and uh, uh, young researcher awards. He works in Saifi Hospital and Zen Hospital in Mumbai. And so we have a person with experience and eminence. Welcome, Dr. Abhijit Ahoja. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the kind introduction. The next panelist is uh, Dr. Amina Mubashir. She's from Delhi. And she also uh, has the European Diploma and is a consultant at the Institute of Respiratory, Critical Care and Sleep Medicine. Max Seket. Uh, she is the organizing chairman secretary of conferences, has numerous presentations, few chess book chapters, uh, and she's a SN Gaur Young Scientist Award winner in APCON 2018. So welcome, Dr. Amina. Thank you very much, sir. And the third panelist is Dr. Varun Patel. He is from Ahmedabad Swasan Chest Hospital. Uh, he, again, has experience in interventional pulmonology, apart from sleep and allergy, which are the other interests. He is a lecturer in pulmonary medicine at the Amrita School of Medicine in Cochin, Kerala. Uh, he was, sorry. And uh, uh, again, we have a very uh, young and... Uh, experienced person on the panel. Welcome, Varun. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the kind info, uh, introduction, sir. Okay. Now we'll move on to the uh, panel discussion. So we, we will have with us the speakers as well, and they will chip in. So I want to start, get back to uh, what Dr. Varun was uh, uh, responding to. He was talking about the common causes of exudative pleural effusion in our country. He mentioned tuberculosis as number one, I think, followed by uh, malignancy. Yes, effusion. Yes, Dr. Varun, do you want to list them in order? Yes, for sir. Us? Para, para effusion followed by the malignancy is the common cause for the exudative uh, pleural effusion in India. So, is tuberculosis the most common in your practice? Yes, sir. Okay, sure. So surely we will have different sequences. Okay. I, I would say probably for us, uh, paranumonic effusions with uh, the, the complex and empyemas are probably the more common uh, cases that we see. Of course, malignancy is also common in our practice and tuberculosis is close by. So I think most of us will deal with these three situations. And thankfully, thoracoscopy is of value in all three. Uh, we will move on to the next question. So, Dr. Amina, uh, we two eminent speakers spoke to us on therapeutic aspects, but we don't start with that. We start with evaluation of the condition. So, clinicians sitting here will be faced with plural effusions, which uh, 
is highly likely to be paranomonic or empyema now how would you approach that situation right sir so if we have a patient whose history and physical examination are compatible or are suggestive of a paranomonic effusion first of all we get a basic imaging done which is a chest radiograph followed by an ultrasound or a ct thorax based on what we find on the x ray picture so it is recommended that most of the cases of a paranomonic effusion should be sampled unless they are too small to be sampled or there is a contraindication to a pleural tap it is always better to do image guided uh, drainage in such cases and for that it is always important to know the safe space so basically when you are doing an ultrasound guided tapping usually there should be at least a 1 cm interface between the chest wall and the uh, lung line that you are seeing where you put in the needle and aspirate when you're doing it under ct guidance this uh, safe space is about 2 to 2.5 cm now we all know that this pleural fluid sample has to be sent for tlc dlc uh, glucose proteins ada ldh different cultures and gene expert also if you're suspecting a tubercular effusion we analyze the reports based on the lights criteria uh, for the benefit of the students here the lights criteria is pleural fluid to serum protein ratio of more than 0.5 or in uh, pleural fluid to ldh ratio of 0.6 or the total ldh of more than two third of the upper limit of normal very interesting uh, thing here is that in cases with heart failure sometimes a false exudative picture comes up particularly in patients who are in diuretics so you might have a bilateral effusion now to differentiate that you have uh, two uh, entities one is the serum to pleural fluid albumin gradient which if more than 1.2 uh, suggests a transudate and a serum to pleural fluid protein gradient more than 2.5 would again suggest a transudate and i also came across a very very interesting entity called as contarini's condition where patients can have a transudative effusion on one side and exudative on the other and the first time it was actually diagnosed in a patient with heart failure who had bilateral transudative effusion and a necrotizing pneumonia with syndromic effusion on the left side so then we move on to the cell count usually a cell count of more than uh, 2000 is uh, significant for a pleural infection however it is not disease specific uh when you have a bacterial empyema usually the tlc is very high to the tunes of 30 40 50 000 more than 10 000 would usually mean para pneumonic effusion it can also be seen in pancreatitis and lupus pleuritis also and if the cell counts are less than 5 000 it's usually tubercular however, however none of this is 100% uh, uh ever so when we look at the differential counts neutrophilic is mostly bacterial or even in cases of acute tubercular effusions we can find it lymphos usually tb malignancy chylothorax sarcoid rheumatoid uh, effusions another very important entity here is when you find eosinophils on your pleural aspirate so whenever you have an eosinophilic effusion meaning uh, more than 10% of eosinophil count always rule out a traumatic aspiration meaning there should have been no air or blood in the in the pleural cavity and if uh, despite that you have an eosinophilic effusion it could be associated with eosinophilic pneumonia and also it carries a high risk of malignancy so needs to be evaluated further based on that also we look at the mesothelial cells which if are more than 5% then tb becomes unlikely another thing is uh, the fluid protein that we look at which is high in tb bacterial empyemas if this protein is very high say more than 8 or 9 then one must consider alternate etiologies like a multiple myeloma uh, ldh more than 1000 would mean a complicated paranomonic effusion uh, in case of uh, effusions that are related to pjp infection the uh, pleural fluid to serum ldh would be more than 1 but the pleural fluid to serum protein would be less than 5 so that's also very interesting uh the glucose would usually be low ada more than 40 would suggest tb but you have to take it with a pinch of salt because it can be falsely high also in cases of empyema so it is never definitive as far as the malignant cytology is concerned the sensitivity is around 60% increases by 15% on the second sample so conventionally we are always taught to send at least two samples when you are suspecting a malignant effusion now you can also do a crp procalcitonin and strem1 in pleural fluid however there is no additional benefit of the same and it probably only adds to the cost of the patient and the last thing which i'd like to add here is the rapid score which was also uh, mentioned in the mist trial which we have been discussing so the rapid score is basically a risk uh, assessment score which includes renal failure age virulence of the specimen 
the infectious source, whether the effusion is likely a hospital acquired effusion uh, or a community acquired uh, paranormonic effusion and the dietary factors predominantly albumin. So if the score is zero to low, there's a low risk if, uh, of mortality. If the score is three to four, there's medium risk. And if the score is five to seven, the patient carries a high risk of mortality. Thank you. I, mean, I think you gave a lecture, mm. but you covered so much in such a short time. So well done. Uh, so I just want to pick up two points that you mentioned. You talked about, uh, you know, conventionally we all uh, used uh, plain radiographs to decide whether we need to sample uh, pleural fluid. And we used a lateral decubitus X-ray. And when the thickness of the fluid was more than one centimeter, we decided it was safe to aspirate the fluid for evaluation. But you just jumped over it and said that we now use ultrasound and you, you mentioned a one centimeter safe space in ultrasound and you talked about CT as well. So I just want to, you know, for the benefit of the audience today, I would just want to reiterate that ultrasound and uh, CT scan and these imaging modalities have uh, kind of overshadowed chest X-ray, which we have come, uh, we have been using conventionally. And again, the other point I would like to reiterate that you mentioned is that aspiration should be image guided. Unless, of course, you don't have a facility and you need to do it, you should do it. But if at all possible, aspiration should be guided. And also you talked about Contarini syndrome, which is bilateral effusions with different etiologies. So bilateral effusions need not always be uh, transudative uh, and uh, bi bilateral effusions can have even two exudative causes on either side. So thanks for bringing this out. I'm sure it was of value to the people uh, who are listening. But we'll move on to the next question, which is the address to Dr. Abhijit. He will talk to us and help us understand the, the jargons that we need to deal with in this topic. So we have paranemonic effusion, which may be complicated or uncomplicated. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we also have a complex effusion. So, and then of course, MPIMA. So I asked Dr. Abhijit to help us understand the differences between these. Um, to begin with, uh, to or rather to revise, the, a paramenic effusion would mean that any fluid effusion that is associated with either bacterial pneumonia, a coexisting lung abscess, or bronchiectasis. And uh, usually in the presence of an uh, infection. Now, if you divide them into complicated and uncomplicated paramenic effusions, the uncomplicated paramenic effusion is typically free flowing, um, it does not have many loculations, there's no evidence of bacterial involvement or is negative on cultures or chemistry. Now, if you again quote the lights criteria where the pH is greater than 7.2 or the glucose being more than 50 or the plural fluid to serum glucose ratio of more than 0.5 and LDH, which is not too high or less than 700. This would mean that the paranumeric effusion is uncomplicated. Uh, any one of these criteria um, along with presence of, say, loculations would mean that this is a complicated paranormal effusion. The other way to look at it or the other way to actually go about understanding what stage of effusion in this is uh, about you're dealing with is either grouping it into exudative, fibrinoproliferative or an organized stage. So you look at an exudative stage where you have a free flowing fluid. A uh, fibrinoproliferative stage where you've got some amount of loculations and you've got still some amount of fluid that is, you know, being seen to you on some sort of imaging, whether it's CT or ultrasound. An organized stage where you're seeing morely just uh, a lot of loculations, very little free flowing fluid. Based on these stages, you can actually go about understanding what kind of treatment you're going to provide to the patient, whether it's going to be less or more invasive and uh, also also 
the complicated or the uncomplicated paradigmatic diffusions can also be grouped into looking at these stages. Thank you, Dr. Abhijit. So I think the jargons are explained. So we have the uh, uncomplicated or simple paranumonic effusion. We have the complicated paranumonic effusion, which shows features of infection uh, with biochemical or microbiological ways. And we have the complex diffusion, which, uh, which we need imaging to sort out and uh, demonstrate loculations. And of course, we have empyema, which is, uh, which, which of course we can see and detect. So we'll move on to the next question, which is to Dr. Varun. So Dr. Varun, yes, sir. the speakers have talked about the, uh, they have really talked about the apex of management of paranebonic effusions and empyema. They have talked about intrapleural treatments and they have talked about the role of thoracoscopy. But you and I know that this is not how we manage all patients and we have to start with the fundamentals. So can you explain the fundamental uh, treatments and their concepts for paranebonic effusion and empyema? So anywhere the oxygenative effusion is there, we have to remove from the pleural cavity. So whether it's a complex complicated, whether it's a impyma or whether it's a parathium pneumonic effusion. As Dr. Abhijit say, the paranoic effusion is a free flowing. There is a no septa in that. There is a not much of a, a protein, septa, coagulation, etc. So it will be gradually, slowly uh, uh, flow out through simple thoracosynthesis. If we have a complicated complex pleural effusion, when you have a more of the septa, in that case, you can put a, a thoracostomy in the tube followed by intrapleural fibrinolysis therapy. So early fibrin will be broken and the whole the pleural cavity, which is divided with the septa because of the complex effusion and the fibrin, uh, fibrin it will now convert to the single one and the, all the fluid will drain out. If the patient having a complex, uh, I can say it's a stage three impyma, in which there is a more of the complex fibrous mature septa, which is can be recognized on a so ultrasonography of the chase. And then that time we have to decide, uh, uh, taking the decision to go for a thoracoscopy, uh, adenolysis and the drainage of the effusion. If a stage four impyma, there is a uh, contrast enhancement of the visceral pleural peel along with a a uh, plural sign that is a fed between the costal cartilage, sorry, uh, rib and a uh, parietal pleura. So that says a very much of advanced stage of the empyma stage four. In that case, we have to go for a VAT or a three port thoracoscopy and uh, uh, adenolysis, debridement of the all locules and the peel over the lung has to be removed. So I think say the foremost, the primary principle of a treatment with the infected plural cavity is to convert into the single cavity and drain out the whatever the infected toxic material is there. Sir, you're on mute. We can hear sorry. you, Varun. Huh? Yeah, sorry. I was saying that antibiotics and drainage of infected fluid are the bottom line of care followed by more complex treatments as required so thank you so let's move on to the next question now we had a whole lecture on um, intrapleural treatments uh, and we do not we are not going to replay that but dr amina i want you to uh, place this in con context of your practice. Now, when in a real life situation, would you instill intrapleural agents? Right, sir. So Dr. Uh, Nitin Chan has already covered the evidence uh, on uh, role of intrapleural enzyme or fibrinolytic therapy in complicated paranumanic effusion. So basically this therapy is given to patients with complicated loculated paranumanic effusions who do not respond to the initial antibiotic therapy and drain it. So if I have a patient with paranormonic effusion, I start him on antibiotics, drain the fluid, but still there is no improvement in terms of the radiological picture or in terms of the clinical picture. The counts are rising, the patient is sick or toxic. 
So then comes the role of intrapleural fibrinolysis as we do it. And uh, uh, see, if you see multiple loculations on the ultrasound again, initially you might just put in a chest tube and even do a, a fibrinolysis upfront. It is best suited for loculations that are thin and flimsy. Uh, once the adhesions become thick, uh, the fibrinolysis might fail. Another very important point that I want to highlight here is that there has been, uh, we have to be absolutely sure that there is no organization. Uh, the empyma is not a stage three complicated organized empyma. There should not be underlying necrotizing pneumonia, in which case the chances of bleeding with the fibrinolytics might increase. There should not be an underlying bronchopleural fistula, in which case the therapy fails or can be counterproductive. So probably in these situations, a good CECT thorax might be helpful in assessing whether or not to go ahead with the intrapleural uh, fibrinolysis. But uh, to put it in a nutshell, any patient who is not responding to the initial therapy plus drainage becomes a candidate for this. Thank you. I think that's a very practical approach, Dr. Amina. Thank you for that. Uh, now I want to move on to Dr. Abhijit. And I want to ask him about the agents, intrapleural agents we have available, and also if if he has used them, and uh, which are the ones that he has experience in using. So um, a variety of agents have been described in literature. However, the ones which have been actually approved by the BTS is not available to us in India. That is TPA and DNA combination. But the ones which are available and that you know, I have used the streptokinase or urokinase and altiplase. So the dosing of that is such that streptokinase, the dose is 2 lakh 50,000 international units diluted in 100 ml saline can be given in two divided doses twice daily for up to three days, a total of six doses. Um, the similarly for urokinase, the dose goes for 100,000 uh, 100, or 1 lakh international units similar dilutions in 100 ml saline and can be either split into two or given once daily up to three days. Um, the way the things are monitored are you know daily serial x-rays and also you can supplement with an ultrasound to understand what is the situation in terms of the way the fibrin is acting or the way the fluid is flowing or in terms of you know how it, the loculations are faring. Altiplase is another agent that can be used, a dose of 25 milligrams in 50 to 100 ml saline, different studies quote in different dilutions. And uh, this needs to be done again up to three days. And one can stop earlier or can continue up to three and even extend up to five with the earlier agents. But with Altiplase, one needs to be more careful. And the last agent that is available to us is Tenectiplase that can be given in a 15 milligrams dose similar dilution of 1500 ml and can go up to five doses. Now this also needs to be done usually once a day and uh, can be assessed as to how the drainage is happening and can be stopped earlier. Thank you, Dr. Vijit. I ask you some question that I didn't plan to ask you but came to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever used just simple saline flushes? Now saline is cheaper than all these drugs. Uh, and do you have any experience just using saline flushes? I have used it in uh, very uh, in the effusions which have got very minimal loculations. But the, when the loculations increase, I have not had the courage to actually just use saline and see how it goes. Okay. So one of the uh, you know the I think it was missed one when they compared uh, fibrinolytics and the control arm used saline, and they fared equally. So there was a there was a counterpoint that perhaps saline flushes are itself good. Mm -hmm. You know the fact that uh, streptokinase didn't do as well is probably because uh, saline flushes themselves may help. But this point was raised. That's why I asked you this question. Uh, thank you. So we'll move on to the next question. Uh, this is to you, Dharmesh. Uh, once again, thank you for the, that excellent lecture. Now, you must be looking at patients as they come for procedures to you or refer to you or uh, you, you see them and try to plan procedures. Now, 
does their comorbidities diabetes hiv ihd do they uh, alter your decision and to what extent and more importantly if they are on anticoagulants or uh, antiplatelet drugs uh, how do you proceed dharmesh uh, thank you dr christopher uh, the uh, the comorbidities actually only to a certain extent will help in decision making in fact on the contrary diabetic are the patients who would probably be more vulnerable to you know pleural infections as a result of which uh, it should not deter us from making a change in the principles of management which over the last uh, one hour we have seen the antibiotics drainage and then the use of some sort of you know dissolving or clot busting stuff versus uh, some surgical methods which could be divided into thoracoscopy versus vats so i think diabetic or ischemic yes ischemic heart disease patients the usual precautions we would take when we do any thoracoscopy procedures such as you know get their cardiac evaluation done and uh, by and large uh, because these are sometimes extensive procedures we often lend up into a general anesthesia situation rather than just conscious sedation so these are certain uh, 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 things which we will probably have to keep in mind uh, but otherwise i don't think there is has to be a gross change in as far as what you are going to offer to these patients coming yeah. to the thrombolysis part of it is i think uh, sorry the use of anticoagulants now if apart from aspirin if there are anything on uh, clopidogrel or even therapeutic anticoagulation then it is well worthwhile trying to stop them with the usual principles which remain for any procedures surgical procedures like you want to be able there's no evidence really clearly showing that if there is an uh, ongoing anticoagulation whether it's going to worsen things but it's gen good general clinical practice uh, to try and stop these uh, before you do any intervention uh, of course if somebody has uh, systemic coagulopathy uh, then we need to correct that uh, if that can be corrected uh, and i think uh, really that's that's about what uh, one would approach when these situations arise so uh, the measure sure just stretch that to uh, intrapleural treatments so yeah. would would the use of anticoagulants or uh, other blood thinning medications would that change your i mean how would that affect your choice of using intrapleural agents would you wait or would you do it i think intuitively yes using intra, any any you know fibrinolytics in the presence of ongoing um, sort of other antiplatelet agents uh, or anticoagulation would intuitively increase you know the bleeding chances uh, however does that mandate uh, you know changing your strategy probably if you can and if uh, there's not a contraindication to discontinuing the anticoagulation before the procedure uh, then uh, you would try and stop that uh, to be on the safer side thank you darmesh uh now i think uh, we have already heard about intrapleural agents in the context of what's available in the country dr nitin is there any experience that you want to share with regard to use of intrapleural agents uh, so we have seen that most of the agents are used single as a single agent in our country and all are showing good efficacy rates but in my practice i am using a uh, streptokinase and alteplase in few patients i have not used urokinase yet but the studies have shown that uh, urokinase is uh, better than alteplase in respect of less chances of bleeding uh, but most of the cases which i have taken is been on the streptokinase as it is easily available economical though it has some effects serious side effects like pain and fever but still uh, i have been good with this streptokinase in my practice yeah uh, you seem to be a firm believer in intrapleural fibrinolytics yes uh, i'm sure it is based on your experience uh, i think that's all that we have so we have to make do with what we have and use it as best as possible and also hope that more evidence comes favoring intrapleural fibrinolytics alone Uh, so that's Sorry. what we should hope for uh, thank you and then moving on to dr varun dr varun we have this uh, the 
inability to give the gold standard intraplural treatment so it has already yes, been alluded to in our discussion uh, so we do not have dnas available uh, so uh, what are the implications for us in the country so you know in in a country in a western country when they have these available then for them to think of other modes of treatment is lot more difficult so we talked about uh, thoracoscopy and of course there are there's material about vats although we did not particularly uh, talk much about it but we alluded to work on uh, vats and uh, and mist 3 so yes, given that we do not have dnas and we cannot combine this with <coughs> antifibrinolytics uh what do you think sir uh, we think of patient as a whole the need of to drain the kvt whatever is way is a infected pleural kvt then if the patient having in early empyema in a stage 1 and stage 2 where the simple thoraco uh, synthesis followed by a thoracostomy and the tube drainage along with the antifibrinolytic therapy can be used but when we use a atplase it costs up near about 1 lakh 10000 and we do a thoracoscopy medical thoracoscopy in early stage of empyema it will cost near about 20 25000 so giving the the benefit of that and if you have at that kind of a procedure facility available in our institute and will weightage about a streptokinase and a uh, atplase Septokinase is a cheaper, as Dr. Abhijit say. The duration dose is a BD for a three days, and uh, at the place is uh, the single dose, but the cost is too high. So we evaluate the patient, the risk versus benefit for a fibrinolysis and a need of a thoracoscopy. As Dr. Dharmesh says, if you do a thoracoscopy and you find out there is an addition, you have to adenolysis and then further follow to maybe a peeling of the of the uh, the peel over the uh, pleural surface. i can say the visceral surface so in that case we have to see the expertise of the institute expertise of the person who can offer the more of surgical treatment to the patient apart for a surgical reference which actually need for the decortication so we have uh, i can subset the patient from early stage to the complex stage availability of the instrument and expertise in that particular institute and of course a financial consideration of each and every procedure like a medical thoracoscopy your patient recovery is early so patient can be mobilized early can go home early can resume to work early compared to the uh, intraplural fibrinotherapy to four days he requires in the hospital followed by the continuous dose of antibiotic that also increase the burden of the cost and followed by the late recovery home rest and the resume to the work another consideration is a finance based on in a foreign country they have a most of the patient are coverage under the government insurance or the some kind of the insurance symptom like but in india the most of the population are under cover of a uh, insurance right now there are effort from the government to cover under ayushman bharat but uh, uh, this therapy it can be included in later on but sir uh, at uh, at this point i can say expertise availability financial consideration and the patient baseline condition is point to decide whether it's a fibrinolytic therapy whatever the available is there with us followed by the medical thoracoscopy followed by the three port thoracoscopy yeah i get what you are trying to say which is what was in my mind so you know if i was practicing in uk or australia i would be under a lot of pressure to use dnas plus uh, alteplase at uh, first before thinking of anything else but in our country since these are not available what we have is not the gold standard intrapleural treatments but what you can call silver standards then yes sir the threshold for use of thoracoscopy changes you are more inclined to use thoracoscopy to expedite uh, healing well thoracoscopy in studies has been uh, as good we we cannot at this point say that it is always better but it is as good as comparators in almost all the studies and we saw the evidence earlier so perhaps there is there would be a lower threshold in our country 
to use thoracoscopy is probably a message that we can keep in mind. Uh, yes, Dr. Amina, you already talked about the imaging modalities uh, very well. Yes, so I want to ask you if you have uh, any more to say on this. And also, uh, are you aware of studies that have compared uh, the sensitivity of chest X-ray to ultrasonography to CT scan? So by and large, sir, uh, uh, ultrasound uh, has a higher sensitivity in detecting the smaller effusions as compared to chest X-rays. About uh, less than 10 ml effusions can also be seen if it is uh, done by an expert uh, ultrasonologist. Coming to your first question, sir, we have uh, discussed about the X-ray, the ultrasound and the CEC to th thorax. One thing which I would like to add to this is that MRI of the chest, although it is not good for the parenchymal pathologies, it is in fact comparable to CT in evaluating pleural disease and maybe better at demonstrating the extension of pleural lesions into the chest wall, into the mediastinum and the diaphragm if you're suspecting a fistula or something. It can identify the hemothoraces better and even a chylothorax if you see the fat attenuation. So one thing is that and apart from the other investigations, of course, whenever there is a doubt of uh, a malignant effusion. PET scan, although has a modest accuracy in differentiating, but if you have good, big pleural masses, then they are uh, FDG avid and may help us in uh, planning the course of treatment for the patient. Yeah. Well, thank you that uh, you talked about MRI. You, you, I mean, it is important to mention MRI, although we are not going to uh, I mean, we are going to very, very rarely use MRI for evaluation of pleuropulmonary diseases. You said that because it's plural pathology, one could invoke a role for MRIs, right? Uh, and of course, I think what is clear also is that, you know, ultrasonography has become the bedside procedure and the first option for evaluation of uh, plural fluid uh, from the imaging perspective. And I think all of us should well acquire or use what is available uh, and ensure that we uh, we are able to pick up things much more efficiently than plain X-ray and cheaper than CT scan. And also use sonography for uh, more safely performing plural aspiration as well as other plural procedures. Okay, with that okay. said, we'll move on to the next question, which is the uh, which is to Dr. Abhijit. So we had an excellent lecture on the role of medical thoracoscopy in empyema and complicated paraneumonic effusions. Uh, so, I mean, at this point in time, we have heard enough of the pros and cons. But one factor that was not particularly discussed was the potential benefit of rigid over flex rigid thoracoscope so what are we what are your views on uh, and what are your views and thoughts on the likely uh, benefit of one over the other or do you think both would do equally well um if you would want to look at what kind of procedure you're planning that would also define what kind of instrument you would want to use now if you're looking at a uh, diagnostic uh, medical thoracoscopy where you just have an exudative effusion and you're not getting an idea as to why the effusions come up and you just need a pleural biopsy good visualization um, very few loculations and a semi-rigid would do the trick but if you want to get into a complicated paraneumonic effusion bordering an empyema a lot of loculations that are seen then uh, rigid the thoracoscope would uh, be the better tool of choice as your you can use a variety of tools through it um your like uh, dr dharmesh patil sir already showed some videos in which you're, you're using different kind of equipment going through the scope and uh, the way the enhanced suctioning the better use of tools gives us better outcomes with the uh, rigid thoracoscope in a more complicated effusion. So I feel that the selection of the case would also mean that the kind of case you're going to look to do 
you would also want to select the right tool yeah thank you dr abhijit so you know there's a lot of debate about uh, flex rigid and rigid in the context of biopsies for example you know the the people who have done rigid thoracoscopy will swear that you will you will get only enough tissue if you use rigid whereas the majority of us who use more flex rigid will say that well what you need you will get with the with flex rigid uh, you may get more with the other with rigid but what you need will be available with flex rigid that's what we would argue but this is a particular scenario where i think most of us would have to concede that rigid probably has a clear edge over flex rigid Absolutely. and dr dharmesh showed us the entire repertoire of instruments that potentially can be used within the pleural space and obviously you cannot do any of those things with flex <laughs> rigid uh, so the caution that he made is very important so this is not a business for an amateur so this is this kind of procedure should be done by people who have a lot of experience who have interest and time to do this and who have the backup required uh, and the experience to handle complications so this is the caution that i think we all should bear in mind but we will conceive that perhaps rigid is more appropriate for clearing the uh, the 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 um uh, i mean the for opening up locules and for clearing uh, tissue within the pleural space so with that i'll go to dharmesh who may uh, just briefly talk about the rigid versus flex rigid uh, and but more importantly dharmesh where do you stop where do you think your domain stops and the surgeon's domain starts i think it's really the time factor in empyema and that's the very essential part of where you you know time frame empyemas and we talked about how it moves from the uh, paranemonic effusion simple to complex to exudative fibrinoproliferative and organized state i think when it comes to and each has a time by and large you know if you have a bacterial you can actually go through like the case which i showed you which it started off with a rather clear looking fluid and in 2 3 weeks time a frank pus was aspirated because it wasn't drained and and maybe inadequately treated and i therefore think that if it goes to the organized state i mean the game is over for a medical thoracoscopist he better not just you know dabble around and all because he will not be able to do real justice to the patient uh, in clearing up the thing by that time a pleural rind is formed the visceral pleura is quite thickened you are not expert at you know uh, removing visceral pleura and decortication procedures so therefore i think it's a clear line as far as i'm concerned when it reaches the organized state uh, it needs to go to the surgeon having said that even prior to that you know each is in case based individually you can take into account uh, uh, once you see and some of the guidelines which can help you is of course the imaging which will help you so time and of the uh, of the whole disease and the imaging are two important things which will help you to decide you know and of course it is extreme the 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 important uh, 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 success rates in any plural intervention is that a patient does not go into a second plural intervention that's how you really assess successes in plural medicine that if for example whether it be pleurodesis or whether it be intraplural fibrinolytic if you need to do a second procedure on the ipsilateral side then that means the, that is how you gauge your success rate so you don't want to fall into a situation where you do an incomplete work with medical thoracoscopy Uh, and then only to be told to the patient that look we've done only half a job and you need now to go to the surgeon so there is a very clear line that you know in organized state hand it over to your surgical colleagues uh, and other cases you take it case by case depending upon the clinical profile the time frame and uh, the the imaging of pleural thickening of very thick septations of slough and debris etc which will help you uh that was one thing i don't need to reemphasize the semi versus rigid uh, dr christopher but i'm thankful to you to reiterate as a moderator that this is not really an amateurish stuff if you don't have the time if you don't have the patience then i would really suggest not to get into this field of thoracoscopy and empyema because it is 
uh, are a very time consuming process number one number two let me tell you also uh, from the uh, uh, it's a painful procedure because it's not easy for two and a half years with a hand on your rigid uh, uh, you know scope and with the others you start snipping at things using suction cannula and and etc so even from the uh, the 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 mechanical uh, 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 sort of you know uh, liabilities which you take on your body, all that really accounts into it. Whiz a whiz when you see a surgeon doing all this, and you saw one of the video clips of Dr. Bhanushali, how you know dexterously he was removing everything. We are not so dexterous. Let's face a fact about it. So when a situation like organization comes, it's best a surgeon, surgical colleague handles things. Yeah. Thank you. Dharmesh, I think we should know where our strengths are and what our limitations are, and we should be humble enough to accept that. Thank you. So we are a little running a bit short of time. I don't want to prolong this, and the audience have been very, very patient for such a long time. So I'll take the liberty to combine some questions and also ask you to be spot on and answer to the point as quickly as possible. And if something has already been said, I think I will take the liberty to skip the questions as well. Uh, so the next question is to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Amina, I'm going to ask you to uh, combine two questions uh, for you. So the first one is, you know, we talked about missed three trial. So I want to, for the sake of the audience, very briefly summarize the, the, the message of the missed trial quickly. And then I also want you, uh, in the interest of time, to take up the next point, which is, uh, do you think there's a role for intrapleural fibrinolytics post-surgery, uh, post post-thoracoscopy, post-VATS, post-thoracoscopy? So just talk about these two things. Right, sir. So to summarize the MIST-3 trial in a nutshell, basically what they did was uh, they uh, 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 sort of sampled patients who were uh, patients of paranemonic effusion. They gave them the standard therapy, antibiotics plus drainage. After 24 hours, they saw whether the patients have responded to this therapy or not, and then they randomized. So by and large, it was a feasibility trial to see whether a head-to-head -head trial between VATS and intrapleural enzyme therapy is feasible and to work out a methodology. But what was interesting here is that the secondary outcomes have uh, gained a lot of importance in this entire MIS-3 uh, trial. So one is that uh, the length of stay be uh, compared between the uh, intrapleural enzyme therapy and VATS uh, uh, showed that the length of stay was lower in patients who underwent a VATS uh, surgery. Second, uh, the quality of life was better for patients. Uh, the quality of life score and the pain scores were lesser for patients who went ahead with the intrapleural enzyme therapy. And uh, uh, basically, it provided a evidence for feasibility and acceptability of a head-to-head -head trial happening as a phase three trial. Now, the strength of this trial was a clear methodology. If you see the age, the comorbidities, or the rapid score of these patients, it is comparable in all three arms. So that is not a confounding factor. The weakness, however, is the size of the study. If we talk about its implications in the Indian context, so basically majority of the centers in India do not have a thoracic surgery backup. And even if they have training in VATS is a, a major concern. So the improvement in LOS uh, with VATS in this study can be taken with a pinch of salt. And the pendulum here in our circumstances probably swings in favor of IET in stage one and stage two paranemonic effusions. Here in stage 2 paranemonic effusions, obviously, if you have medical thoracoscopy uh, available and if you're an expert at it, then that would be a very good option. However, I would like to reiterate that in cases of organized stage 3 empyema, upfront, we should go for a VATS or thoracotomy. It would be the best way forwards. There is also an option of medical thoracoscopy with intrapleural uh, fibrinolysis. So there are multiple studies. The largest that I could find was on 131 patients where they did, uh, which was published in uh, January 2023 only. So there were about 131 patients who were given uh, uh, a trial of uh, medical thoracoscopy followed by fibrinolysis in the same go. And it was found that 76% of these patients did not need any surgical intervention. So as far as, uh, again, our experience is concerned, stage two paranemonic effusions with thin loculations 
we do medical thoracoscopy followed by installation of streptokinase 2.5 lakh units up to three times 24 hours apart with great results. We don't even attempt a thoracoscopy in patients with organized empyema and refer them for an early VATS unless they have a contraindication to surgery, in which case we try and access the largest pocket if we can take biopsies, do mechanical fibrinolysis followed by streptokinase installation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Amina. So the next question is going to be to Dr. Varun. Uh, Dr. Varun, uh, I want you to address the, I think, uh, uh, Amina talked about the role of fibrinolytics post-procedure. Yes, sir. Uh, so perhaps there is some role uh, and perhaps better outcomes if you do that. But I think that, that again requires a lot more evidence. But I want you to talk about uh, intraparoral fibrinolytics before procedure. Now, particularly in the context of loculated paranemonic effusions, uh, do you think there's a role for first instilling intraparoral fibrinolytics and then going for a thoracoscopic procedure? Sir, I do not feel if the, we offer the patient for an intraparoral fibrinolytic therapy, prior we are decided to go for a thoracoscopy in this patient. If medical thoracoscopy uh, has to be proceeded because of the failure of intraparoral fibrinolytic therapy, that is is okay. But if we are going for a surgical intervention, then uh, as Dr. Dharma showed the stuff, whatever we do in a thorax, with the jugglery of the instrument, you can adenolyze the thick septa. It's not going to help us with the intraparoral fibrinolytic therapy. That is only help when in the early stage 1 or 2 impyma, where it's a very thin fibrin. So I do not feel any advantage to proceed for uh, first intraparoral fibrinolytic therapy followed by a thoracic if that was failed, then definitely a medical thoracoscopy is the option. Thank you. So the next question is to uh, is to Dr. Nitin. So Nitin, have you ever encountered complications that required you to call a surgeon uh, or, or or any other complications of importance? Till date, uh, by the God's grace, I don't have any such complication that I have to call a surgeon. But uh, in some cases, uh, sometimes there is a, a BPF or the re-expansion pulmonary edema in few cases or the prolonged air leak which uh, persists after the medical thoracoscopy is being done. And these are the cases only which I have uh, encountered. And fever and chest pain in few patients, but they are more or less uh, well to do with tremadol and paracetamol. And that is all which I have encountered as a complication in my practice. Yeah, thank you. You must be a very careful, uh, careful procedurist or a surgeon. Uh, so good, keep up that good record. Uh, so I wanted to make one point. You know, there is always this caution: you should never do thoracoscopy unless a surgeon is there Indicate. as a backup, is a myth. So I mean, for those who are starting thoracoscopy, once you know your skills and once you confine to your domain, to your strengths, and not become very adventurous, and you should always start small. Start by taking. Uh, just biopsies, start by choosing the cases carefully, I think you will be able to make progress. So we re really do not need to have surgeons just waiting outside in case you goof up. Uh, and that situation of having said that luxury doesn't exist, uh, well, not only in our country, perhaps anywhere in the world. Okay. So now I think uh, in the interest of time, we probably will wind up here. So I just wanted to summarize the excellent points that came up during the lectures as well as the discussions. We had a very lucid talk by Dr. Dharmesh who brought out the potential benefits of using medical thoracoscopy uh, in this group of patients. It is important to uh, note here that since we do not have DNAs and cannot combine, combine that with fibrinolytics, we really do not have the best 
uh, non procedural treatment available for us so this is an area that we perhaps have to look at with caution and of course the the amount of uh, uh, in procedural intervention you perform will definitely depend on your experience and skill and your time and all other things that were reiterated so for someone who has the expertise time i think this is uh, there is a scope for medical thoracoscopy in carefully chosen patients having said all this we have to humbly accept that uh, sufficient evidence to establish this and its exact position in the scheme of things is not yet available but it is only people like us people like you watching that create these evidences we hope we are able to perform some good quality studies and establish the role for medical thoracoscopy uh, of course before th then we we had uh, an another nice lecture on the role of intrapleural treatments and uh, of course to uh, i mean dr jain was very practical and he said that the single uh, intrapleural fibrinolytics available were all good and effective in his practice i agree with him in carefully chosen patients we should use intrapleural fibrinolytics again uh, more evidence needs to be forthcoming to draw out a clear algorithm and know how much benefit we can get and between agents what is the best uh in the in terms of foundational principles we reiterated the role of imaging particularly ultrasound which all of us should try and have access to and in plural diseases this is absolutely crucial to have uh, both for uh, both for the um, i mean in terms of the diagnostic yield as well as safety of the patients when we perform our intrapleural procedures and we all know that the basic approach to pleural effusion should be uh, well understood and we have to evaluate the effusion carefully diagnose the patients and for those with pleural infections we would drain we would give antibiotics and then judiciously chose choose the methods we discussed about during this uh, webinar so with that i want to close by thanking all my speakers and panelists dr patel and dr jain thank you for the excellent talks thank you sir dr abhijit dr varun and dr amina thank you very much all your insights were extremely practical extremely useful and that's the purpose of the panel to bring in real life insights and interpret the evidence that is presented to real life context so thank you very much and i want thank to thank you, the audience the audience have been extremely patient it has been a long session so thank you very much and we hope all of you had something to take home with that i want to thank the sponsors once again they have done an outstanding job in supporting this venture and uh, uh, thank you very much and good night and we'll meet again sometime thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you sir, thank you, sir.